All right. Well, Father Lynch, we are thankful to have you here at Transfiguration, thrilled to have you at the parish. You are participant, I think, maybe five or six of, of uh, Beyond Justin Cordham and myself of participating in this podcast. And uh, I want to take this opportunity to know a little bit about you. I mean, I know about you. I know I know all about you. But the good, faithful people of Transfiguration uh, do not know much at all. And okay. so I want to take this time to to uh, to figure out the puzzle, the enigma in the riddle, in the question that is the son of Connecticut, Father Brian Lynch. Father Lynch, welcome to Transfiguration. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's good to be here. It's good to be back on the Rockin' East side. Yeah. And that'll come up again later. So I guess I'll just launch into like a long rambling dissertation about please, my... Please, please. So I'm the son, the oldest of four na, 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 of Thomas na, na. and Kathleen Neendris Lynch who were New Yorkers. My mom grew up in Queens in a neighborhood called Jackson Heights and my father in a town called Nude Hyde Park on Long Island. So they um, they got married in, must have been 1967. Mm, crazy times. Crazy times. And so I am a child of crazy times because I was born in 1968. My. Everyone's favorite year. Yes, indeed. Great year for moral the theology. Spirit of six. Oh, that's at sixty nine. Okay, never mind. Um, so yeah, so uh, they. I was born in Queens in Flushing, and then they had a home in Comac, Comac, New York, and we lived there for I think the first three years of my life and my brother my uh, brother Kevin was born my sister Jean was born actually just before him and then my father wanted to get out of New York and so we moved to Connecticut mm. which first, is far I mean obviously I can see it in the map but how long's the drive you got you, you can't unless you got one of those cool duck boats <laughs> you've got you can't drive on the Long Island Sound so you have to go around you have to go it's about a it would be about a 3 hour drive to where we first moved okay. in okay. Uh, in uh, New Milford. We only lived there for about a year then we moved to Cromwell, Connecticut which, which was fantastic, was a great place to I lived there between the ages of about 5 and 10. Some of you might know Cromwell, it's the, it's the home of Holy Apostles Seminary. Hmm. I had no idea when I was a kid. Hmm. It's uh it's also the um the home of like the Padre Pio Center. Oh so wow! If you have some, I don't. I didn't know that. It may not have even My been goodness. the case wow. when I was there. But at any rate, it's a, it's a it's a cool town, even even though it's named after a scoundrel, Amen. an absolute Amen. scoundrel. Amen. But it's a cool town, and um, and then too, I we lived. I lived on close to the border with a place called Rocky Hill, Connecticut. Okay. And Rocky, so, th so this this is location number three since leaving from New York. This is location two. Two, okay, bigger part. After Cromwell, New York. then Rocky. No, Rocky Hill is the neighboring town. Oh, I'm sorry, bigger part. Okay. So okay. so so um, Comac, New York. I think Comac was had the Amityville horror stuff going around. I think it's My near goodness. Amityville. So yeah, okay. some interesting places. <laughs> the. Uh, so uh, that that gets at my my um, antagonistic Amen. relationship with with Satan, which we will return to, of course. And um, so then New Milford, then Cromwell, and Cromwell. We live near the really close to the border of Rocky Hill, and Rocky Hill is the home of 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 the Connecticut State Dinosaur Park. There's there's an <laughs> enormous bubble. It, you see, a, well, it could be different now, but like a, one of these sports bubbles that you've seen in places, and it covered just a field of of dinosaur fossils, oh my footprints. Heavens. So, as a child, dinosaurs were very alive to me. I would go out into my backyard 
and look for fossils because hey wow. there's a whole bunch of right. them next right next door so they're probably here too yeah um so it, yeah it was i i loved crap we lived on the wow. end of this cul-de-sac and we had a just a stream in our our backyard Sounds and idyllic. it was fantastic it was fantastic we we're seven or so houses unfortunately over time the the five or so families with children the, they moved away mm-hmm. and so it became we were sort of isolated so we um we did move to where my mom still lives in vernon connecticut which is a northeast suburb of hartford and close to um the university of connecticut okay so that's where i that's where i went to what we call middle school i think junior high yep. same sort of thing and then um i then my parents decided that i was to go to catholic high school which okay. was not my first choice but um but that when i grew up you just did what your parents told you to do that's right that's so right. so i went i ended there wasn't a, those there days. was not a there was not a conversation and nobody was really too concerned about my feelings my father just didn't want me to become a drug addict which was <laughs> i think a, a reasonable a reasonably desirable outcome right, since amen. he knew uh, a lot about the local public school, which yeah. was actually really close. I had to take a city bus to East Catholic High School in um, Manchester, Connecticut, which has actually had some notoriety over the years. Though I, I understand it's struggling now, unfortunately. Hopefully, um, hopefully they'll they'll um, be financially. Hopefully they'll be able to, to sort it out. But it so it, it was the high school for. The northeast suburbs of of Hartford, and okay. so it was like a twenty minute bus ride or something okay. like that. City bus, half an hour city bus, yep. and um, so I went there, and I uh, I I loved science. In in middle mm. school, I fell in love with the periodic table. Wow, and the structure of of Adams. Now, see, that is not a sentence that one is used to. I, I, when I was in middle school, I fell in love with the periodic table. Yeah. What about it was such a siren song? Well, and that's what I think is... Um, unfortunately, we contemporary American Catholics have have been deceived and led to believe that science and religion are mm. at odds with one another. Amen. But when I... When I learned of the periodic table and the order mm. that one finds in the periodic table and how you can predict the properties of elements because of the structure and there there's a, a basic template in which these all are built and they follow all these laws and mm. I the 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 beauty of the order to me Symphonic. was it spoke. I, I mean, it wasn't like I said to my teacher, "Like God did this and got." Uh, but that's the impression it made. Right. Like, there's clearly something. This is not random. Yeah. This is unbelievable. Yeah. So I loved it, and I loved chemistry. And so when I went to high school, um, I was a serious student. I was. I was a really hard. Work. My brother and sister. Um, are very intelligent. My brother Kevin and, and my sister Jean are very intelligent. And it put me in an awkward situation when I was in elementary school because I had to work, though I was the oldest, mm-hmm. I had to work really hard to keep up with them. It came, mm-hmm. well, credit where credit is due. They were voracious readers. Mm-hmm. And I was not, I was more like, I was out looking for fossils. Exactly. And playing baseball. Yeah. And, we'll return to that too, baseball. And, uh, and so, um, so I had to work. I kind of got my act together because, um, yeah, I was I, I was I was concerned that I was my own abilities were being underestimated, mm. and I'm a very competitive person. So mm-hmm. I began to work really hard at at academics, and so that that has that is. Uh, been good for me has has been a very uh has been a real blessing 
I um, so I was a serious student in high school, and then I um, and I love baseball and mm. the conventional ball sports, but I don't have the best hand eye coordination, okay. so I wasn't going to be able to play on any kind of high school team. Mm. Our t- our school was actually pretty accomplished at a number of sports, so that would o- would have only made it very different. <laughs> so I I think at the invitation of a friend decided to go out for wrestling. Uh, okay, I was going to ask about that. Wrestling was in with with relatively few exceptions. It was different than it is in Minnesota. It was it was a sport that many kids in Connecticut started to participate in in high school. Hmm. So it was hmm. relatively small fraction of kids who would have had wrestling experience prior to high school. So that was um that wasn't a terrible setback for me that yeah. I was just starting. That was common enough. What was um difficult was that when you are Though you are working hard and you are very comfortable sitting at a desk and and reading and and doing arithmetic, wrestling is very painful. <laughs> it there's an extremely high level of discomfort in the whole exercise with somebody's constantly tugging yeah. at you, and it's very. I've seen unpleasant. some of these pictures from the from the Minnesota from the Minnesota tournament, and yeah, it lo- it looks like a contortion, lots of contortions going on. Yeah, I can't imagine how they're going to manage it now with with COVID. It has mm. to be the sport with the most difficulty social distancing. I would think so, <laughs> kind of by definition, um, yeah. But. Um, so I went to that first practice and uh, I was miserable. And my dad picked me up. You know, no no bus when you're you're staying after school. Mm-hmm. Our team was terrible. We had the worst equipment. We had we we were relegated to leftovers. It was it was shameful. I hope they still don't. We had to carry our mats from the gym. <laughs> to the cafeteria every day and like setups it was it was uh it was shameful but it was i was miserable i was so uncomfortable and my dad picked me up after practice he says something like so how'd it go and i said oh you know okay i guess and (laughs) he said well what and so what time am i gonna pick you up tomorrow and I said, uh, well, you know, I'm not sure I'm going to go back tomorrow. Ooh. And then my dad did one of the best things. And any dads out there, I hope you'll listen to me if, you have been, if you've been able to persevere this long. <laughs> the one of the, he was not, he was not an, a very outspoken person. He did not intervene in my life with great frequency. But he said very sternly in that crucial moment, you are going back. And God bless him. One of the best things he ever did for me because I would have quit, but he made me go. And then it ended up being sort of a defining quality of mine through high school i went on to do very well i mean in time i got beat up for for (laughs) at least two years i'm ashamed to say perhaps even more but then my senior year something really clicked and uh i did quite well and i was the captain of the team and so it was tremendous just tremendous and so good for my yeah so good for me so good for me Mm. so so dads, please do mm. keep keep that in mind when you're trying to help your your kids to persevere in in difficult things. So high school was uh, at East Catholic was was a, a great experience. I was sort of I was sort of s- a lot of s- sort of stealth and and quiet in the, my three first three years. As far as like I wasn't much of a um, a personality. And rather, I would say my introversion was probably encouraged in many ways. Mm -hmm. But then in my senior year, a number of factors came together that caused me to 
have to be a more public person and uh and that, and that was good too i mean yeah. that's some of what's allowed me to go on to be a priest i suppose yeah. so i i continue to love and and science and do well in it and um i can i can even sing a song sure that, uh, why not so is this a, is this like a science song yeah it was it was shameful our 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 physics teacher our senior year I don't think she knew what she was doing. And we were, I was in a, we had to do a group project and everyone probably has some very strong feelings about group projects. Yes, and indeed. I would have a certain set of, but I was in a great group with Joel Suzuki, who was the smartest kid in our grade. He was our valedictorian. And Billy Revelis, who is Billy Revelis, Billy a great name. Revelis, a great one of name. the greatest characters of. I mean, he could be in. He could be in movies. This guy was was something else. So um, she gave us some options, and we decided rather than do like a serious science project, <laughs> we, make a song? we would do a parody song. Okay, um, kind of reminds and, me of some of our seminary work. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> We d- and then I think it was the the Huey Lewis it was a Huey Lewis song. Sometimes bad is bad. I think. Okay. Um. Anyhow, it, the the lyrics the lyrics are in that mysterious realm where they're just eluding me now. But um. At any rate, we uh we kind of charmed <laughs> her and did all these crazy stuff. But so but I did love science and um. I went on to uh, to to study. At, at Penn State University, I, mm-hmm. I, en- I enrolled as a chemistry major, but they, um, but the summer of of nineteen eighty six, when I was going going to be entering into college, the Time Magazine, which used to be a thing, and my dad <laughs> got it in the mail like every week. On the cover of Time Magazine that summer, there were two separate articles. One was that ceramic engines were going to revolutionize the automotive industry. And then there was another article that said that superconductors were going to revolutionize the computer industry. And I thought, computers, cars, those are cool, pretty good things. So I want to do that. So when I went to Penn State, I went to the my chemistry orientation. I said, these are the things I'm interested in. What should I do? And they said, well, we, you should actually go to a different department, hmm. the Department of, of Material Science and Engineering. And, and they said, and they're giving money away. So I said, well, even better. <laughs> Sign me up. So it was really, it was, um, it was, it was good in, in many respects. I probably narrowed my options by studying that discipline as opposed to just as mm. a chemistry a, a more broad discipline but um but it was enjoyable i really i really did like it and um now let me ask you when when you say ceramic ceramic engine is this like made out of clay i mean what when i hear ceramics and of course we've talked a little bit about your own background educationally and when I first heard that phrase ceramics, yeah. I, I think I thought much more specifically, you're talking about a much more broad reality. Yeah. So at least when I studied materials, they were they were divided into three broad categories. The other two are probably more obvious to people. They were they were metals, metallurgy. Mm-hmm. And plastics and ceramics. So ceramics, generally speaking, are, well, things that aren't metals and things that are not plastics. Often they're oxide materials. They, um, they're they characterized by being, well, they've got all kinds of, of, of properties, but they would... They would generally be non-corrosive. They would be, yeah. It, it's Are there, hard. Is there it's any hard to? Is um, there any common household items that would well, be? Well, the so you know, I, I came to work when when I when I finished all my studies, I came to work for 3M, and and 3M is in fact. It's probably not even the case anymore. I think they officially changed the name to officially 3M, but it used to stand for Minnesota Mining and Manufacturing. Mm-hmm. And the first product that 3M made was sandpaper, mm-hmm. and they mined 
they mined, mining, uh, they mined aluminum oxide, also called corundum, I believe up by Duluth. Mm -hmm. And they they processed that and then they they pasted the aluminum oxide powder particles whatever to paper and the voila sandpaper okay right yeah so um aluminum oxide would be considered a ceramic abrasive materials generally speaking like silk and carbide mm. would be a, a ceramic that you see in tool you know okay. tool manufacturing okay but you uh, you'll see in some like uh, non-stick uh, cooking ware, there'll be sometimes a ceramic coating mm. that's there. Yeah, ceramics run the whole range from really low tech materials. Glass is technic in the old, at least divisions when I was studying glass. We had a course on glass, at least one, probably more. Glass would be included in. Let me get this straight. You had a full class on glass. Yeah, yeah. man. Yeah. Pull the mic up. Maybe I might want to pull the mic up a little bit. I want to be. I want people to hear about glass as a class. Yeah, we had a, a glass on uh, a class on glass for sure. Uh, Doctor Carl Pavano, I remember he was. Uh, he had some good memories for names. Yeah, yeah. There was, there were, you know, we. It was nice that department was much smaller than chemistry. So mm -hmm. one of the the things that I enjoyed about it is that our in at a at a school like Penn State, you're you're often in class with hundreds of people. But right. in 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 ceramics and material science, our classes were much smaller, so, and you got to interact with the professors a lot. Yeah, so ceramics include glass. Even concrete, we had classes oh. on not, you know, not like how to mix a batch of concrete, <laughs> but like the chemistry of it, sort of yeah. things like that. Yeah. And then the 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 superconductors were considered the um, were considered ceramics because they were oxide materials, complicated okay. oxide materials, abrasives like silk and carbide, silk and nitride. These were going to be the materials that the automotive engines were were made from. Unfortunately, in a sense, I when I entered college, there was a great deal of hope and promise for for ceramics in both superconductors and automotive engines, but the during the 4 years that I spent as an undergrad there, they determined they f they figured out that the superconductors were not going to work because they in any real consumer application because the current density combination of things that you could you could maybe have a superconductive so super con so in your toaster the reason that you can make toast in your toaster is that is that the metal that makes the wires in your toaster is not a superconductor. It it gives it it resists the flow of electricity. So mm. that resistance is translated into heat. Who knew? I, I who knew? And yeah. So um, so the resistance is equivalent to the heat that's generated. Oh. That's the energy that there's a homily there somewhere. Man, oh man. Oh sure. Wow. And um, so, but a superconductor. What a superconductor means is that it provides no resistance, mm -hmm. and so the all the current goes through and nothing's lost, mm -hmm. and there's no heat, and so you it, you know it's hard for it to keep up. When when I was a young adult, any computer I had would have a fan because it's got to yeah. cool it, and with so a superconductor, there's no need for fans and all that. Cause there's no no cooling required um but then unfortunately not only was the the um the uh the current the the current you couldn't pass enough current through the superconductor to make it work so mm -hmm. if you tried to pass the current in your toaster through a superconductor it mm -hmm. would it wouldn't work it just it didn't and then also um the materials some materials are superconducting at extremely low temperature 
And there, so there was a need to make superconductor materials that would be have that superconducting property at room temperature, but that that apparently was too elusive. That you were still gonna need like liquid. Um, I don't know if it was liquid nitrogen or, or some, some or you know that what is it? Uh, what's that stuff that smokes? Dry that, ice. Dry ice. You need <laughs> you know those sort of like right. Not practical. Yeah. Not practical. So the four years I spent in college, they figured out that wasn't going to work. And then also with automotive engines, you know, we had classes on mechanical properties of ceramics, and s- almost the vast majority of the class. All the theory, all the practice that I re- recall was, how are we going to keep these things from breaking catastrophically? <laughs> you know, you think of what coffee, mu- you drop, if you're in your kitchen and you drop a fork, right. you're not worried about it breaking. Yep. Amen. That's a metal. Amen. Metals bend. Yeah. Metals give. Yep. You drop your coffee mug, you're worried it's going to break. You drop your glass. 100%. Ceramics break catastrophically. Okay. Auto manufacturers do not <laughs> like seems like catastrophic a bad mix with building engines. Yeah. <laughs> they do not like catastrophic failure. So you might be able to build one in the theory that ran in your laboratory and right. worked really well and some of the some of the desirable properties of in thermodynamics the higher the temperature the um the better the efficiency and all. Hmm. So with ceramics, you could run at higher temperatures than metals because metals will melt. But um, yeah, the catastrophic Man. failure became <laughs> too much. Nobody likes their car to just shatter. Break, shatter. Yeah. So so when I finished, there was I was I was eligible for jobs that to me were not particularly attractive Mm -hmm. um as as good as they might be for for some people i was looking at um working in probably some glass application and the one that i got um the most uh opportunity to do was um was the processing of nuclear waste (laughs) which you know on reflection i decided i just didn't want to do that so um so i i ended up i ended up staying on for graduate school and penn state at penn state yeah Yeah, it was it had the way things turned out for many of us uh were in the same situation and so a, a number of us stayed on and I, I I did I did well in um in undergrad and and felt really good and but the truth is that at the undergrad level level I was I was pretty much peers with and competing with so to speak smart kids from Pennsylvania which mm. were and they were they were smart and they were dedicated often and and but I um I I did well enough in that group but then when I went mm. to graduate school at the yeah. same institution, it became uh, an international pool. And yep. not only were these folks from China and India and Africa, uh, not only were they very intelligent, they were extremely dedicated. Mm. And I... That... That experience of my sort of limits gave me an opportunity to think about what I really wanted to do. Mm-hmm. And so I started to take uh, the faith more seriously. I, I, I thought I basically wanted to be I realized that I I don't know if I put it in these words exactly, but the truth is I wanted to be a superhero. <laughs> and but I was afraid of blood, mm-hmm. so I wasn't going to be a doctor. And I didn't want to be shot at, nor did I really want to shoot people. Right, right. So I, I kind of knew that I wasn't going to be a police officer. And in my K- Connecticut upbringing world, the super, the superhero, the the achievable superhero mm. roles, um, I wasn't, I really didn't want to run into burning buildings. So... <laughs> 
We were down to priests. Right. That's right. <laughs> Process of elimination. So um, I started to take it more seriously. And I, I I had friends in 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 college. And it's possible that laws were broken during that time. Just possible. Just and possible. I, I didn't have all of the virtues. But I, I recognized when I looked at my friends and the way that they lived, I had a a sneaking suspicion that celibacy was a possibility for me. I okay. I could see in some of my friends that it was not a possibility for them. <laughs> but <laughs> but um, I could see that it was a possibility for me. So um, that allowed me to at least pursue it in yeah. good faith. Yeah. And um, the Benedictine monks were at Penn State. Oh, wow. I didn't know that. Yeah, this, the Benedictine monks from St... Oh, Vincent, Vincent, probably St. Vincent in, in, in Latrobe. In, in Latrobe. And, and they were there as students? Nope. They were there running the Newman Center. Gotcha. Okay. And there was a, a priest, Father Fred Byrne, who was terrific, and I really benefited from him, and a, I think a, a Father Conan, I think, was, uh, you know, they... And I remember going to the Newman Center one day when I was taking things seriously, I w- and, I, and I, I had gotten my courage up to ask them about becoming a priest Mm. but i i got scared and i think what got me scared at that point the um i could understand being a priest but i i was so unfamiliar with monks that Mm. i got cold feet i couldn't Mm. i i just i didn't know that i could be a bridge too far a monk so i i think i I just I, I I don't think I'm almost certain I didn't bring it up and um but I still was considering it seriously and uh but thought that I should give science a chance. I had spent so many years studying it and, mm-hmm. and really did love it. Um I thought I should get a chan- uh give it a chance and so I did get the the job here with uh with three M in Building two hundred one. Some of you probably know exactly. Oh, I'm it's, sure it's of that. the the build. It's building low to the ground at the corner of McKnight and ninety four with the flagpole. Oh, wow. And I was in the, passed by that building quite often. Yeah, and I I worked in the basement there in the lab in a a, a technique with a technique called X ray diffraction. It was a great job. Three M was a, is a great company and. But the truth is there was a, a great deal of r- routine sample preparation, which was rather tedious mm-hmm. and repetitive. And I kind of thought I didn't want to do I would have it was great. If I had had a family, I would have mm-hmm. been crazy to to leave. Mm-hmm. It was such a good place to work, but I was I was sort of free and I was able to think about what I wanted to do, and I started to go to to daily mass. That and that was something. The move to 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 Minnesota was really significant for me, and and sort of the reason that I I ended up staying here because I was susceptible enough to peer pressure in at Penn State, where I had a particular reputation, and um, <laughs> we won't ask uh, and. Uh, um, it could be, and Justin can can edit this out. It was something like the life of the party. But, okay, um, okay. <laughs> we're going to leave that in. Uh, and uh, and but I was able to um, to reform my life to the extent that I was like a really good friend to people, and I was the designated driver a lot, okay. and I and was a, a marveled at my friends and their their uh, capacities, capacities and antics, and. But I, I, I uh, get. But to have to have pursued something like daily mass, there, there was it just wasn't going to happen. I, I so, but so, but when I came to Minnesota, I think I knew one person. I mm. think, I think a man by the name of George Saint George. Which wow. I don't know if I do that to my child, wow. but he went to East Catholic too, and I think he was here. But I think he was wow. the only person I knew, and. I, I don't know that I saw him more than twice when I got here, but I could be anyone that I wanted. So all, mm-hmm. I could I I I started to go to daily uh, mass at, at Saint Louis King of France because I lived in downtown Saint uh, Saint Paul, 
And uh, that was funny, meeting with Father Morrissey the first <laughs> time. Because that's, a, that's a, a French national parish. Yeah. And so... And you ain't French. I'm not French. So... He kind of he kind of told me what the deal was that mm-hmm. if I was if I was going to um if I was going to be there I was he, there was going to be stuff expected of me. Oh, I was God very bless him. I'm very impressed. God I don't bless him. Um and it was good for me. And so I uh I started going to daily mass there and 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 it, and it was very good for me and I ended up I ended up meeting a fellow who belongs to a local Carmelite community mm-hmm. at that daily mass, and he invited me to go out out there, and I ended up joining that community. So I, mm. I I joined, and it was some of the reason that I stayed in Minnesota as as a, a brother with the intention of going on to seminary was that they allowed me to join the community. And continue to work at 3M oh, okay. in the initial yeah. stage. So it was, I had thought that I might go back east and join the Dominicans mm. because my father worked for the Knights of Columbus in New, in New Haven and mm. the Dominicans are the uh, the chaplains there. But it seemed like a, a sort of hedging my bet to <laughs> to um, to not just give up on 3M, to, to do the at the same time and yeah. but then after a short time I, I started to work for uh for the parish there St. Michael and West St. Paul mm-hmm. and and was a brother there for for 6 years until mm-hmm. entering seminary with you yep. in 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 2002 and when I when I started seminary I was a member of the community but a number of factors including I'm I Probably multitasking isn't my strong suit, and I kind of I kind of recognize that, and it it it's continues to be, um, sort of a blessing, and also, but then, as we know, the 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 other side of your blessing is often Amen. a cross, and I I recognize that I I think. I can't do both of these particularly well. I don't know that I can be a priest, at least as the way I understand it, the the, the apostolic work required, and also be the religious, as mm. I understand, a life dedicated to prayer and community life. And I thought we're clearly... Um, the priesthood is not devoid of prayer and, and community life, I didn't think I could be a good religious and priest. I just didn't. Yeah. I think I would be sort of constantly frustrated, like I'm not doing either of these very well. And when you say priesthood, Father, you're you're speaking of the secular priesthood. You're talking about diocesan priesthood or just priesthood in general. Um, I think, um, I would say a parish priest mm-hmm. in that you know if I was going to work in a parish because that's that's how I have pretty much always understood priesthood you know yeah. and so so some religious communities are in parishes yep. and and god bless them they're they're they you know we're all different we all have different personalities and 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 uh but i i when i that seemed after living community life especially a carmelite community life the amount of prayer that we had the, the mm-hmm. amount of structured liturgical prayer at specific times and all I just thought I can't do these both well, yep. and so it was at that point I decided to, to. After the first year, I decided to to no longer be part of the religious community and to to just, so to speak, be a, di- <laughs> di- a, a diocesan seminary, yeah, a seminarian. And so I went through uh, seminary with you, yeah. The glory years. The 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 glory the glory years. How can we describe that? What, what <laughs> you what, know what, what I, would you like to talk about? Well, I, I want to say you know, and, and I and I mean to, I do not mean to besmirch anyone who feels differently, of course, but you know, I I really enjoyed my years in seminary. I enjoyed those four years. I I I love the community life. I really did. I liked 
Uh, we we were we were we were what are they called overlords fourth year yes. we we were overlords also known as prefects of the of second floor yes uh, we we <laughs> we had some wonderful images of our reign which was great yes um, the, the mace of second floor pride yes like, 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 like a medieval mace I'm not talking about like mace in the face I'm yeah, talking no. like a mace uh, speaking of which our thurifer that is the heaviest thurifer I have ever experienced you know, that uh, is essentially a mace. <laughs> That is a weapon. <laughs> It's a, it's a, it's a metal it's a it's a weapon for good it's a, it's weapon, a weapon for good, for good that's for sure uh, but no I, I I enjoyed our time in seminary it was uh, you know uh, I certainly enjoyed some classes more than more. what was your favorite class in seminary number one oh gosh my favorite class in seminary the, there will be some editing here I uh, <laughs> maybe I. Uh, Wow, I mean, it's so hard. You know, we had so many different kinds of classes yeah. that were, you know, we had we had so many of the conventional Monday, Wednesday, Friday for an hour classes that were were good. Gosh, I don't, I don't know. You know, the fun. I guess, you know, the fondest, as crazy as it is, the the fondest memory. Is probably Father Gillespie's uh, yeah, ministry pastoral class. counseling. <laughs> yes, <laughs> where um, we went on a lot of field trips. Yes, we did. We, I think we watched the movies. Yes, too. we did. <laughs> yes, we did. But um, my, I'm sure I'm sure the listener is very consoled fa- by our deep intense <laughs> <laughs> spiritual preparation. <laughs> my favorite, I think. The instance of seminary I remember more than any was we went to uh, to Northeast and we we did a tour of Catholic elder care. Yes, I remember that. And, I do remember um, that. There was a a wonderful woman. I think her name was Mary, who mm. was the um, some kind of administrator for the Catholic elder care. And um, if you don't know Father Gillespie, it's a shame for one, and and uh, it's going to be hard to understand this, but. Um, <laughs> He, Mary was speaking of the residents with such emotion and conviction, she started to weep. Mm. And Father Gillespie turns to her and says, for goodness sakes, Mary, get a hold of yourself. Have a drink or something. <laughs> very, very sensitive. <laughs> <laughs> so that was uh that was a great memorable class. that was a very memorable class you know we had so many greats I, I you know i, I i'm a i love academics i you mm. know and i don't and i wreck again i was in graduate school i know what really smart is mm. i worked at 3m i know when people are really smart i'm not dumb but i'm not a genius <laughs> and um but regardless of whether how wonderful I am at it or not, I just plain enjoy school mm-hmm. academics. I just enjoy school work. Yeah. And yeah. so I so many classes I enjoyed. You know, scripture classes were were often uh, very significant yeah. for me. Yep. That so so we we and we had, we had a, a number of of those of course. Yeah. Put a timeout right here. Okay. We're, we're going to break. Uh, this is going to be a two-parter, this okay. this, this podcast. Uh, so when we pick up next time, you have just entered seminary. The glorious reign of, okay. of second floor pride yeah, has begun. Yeah, we can think about, I can do a little more prep on, on seminary and what, what we did there. And uh, and so we're going to talk about seminary next time. We're going to talk about uh, your first couple of assignments, your time in Belle Plain, and some real battles you did with the forces of darkness. Yes. I mean that only half kidding. Uh, yes. And then uh, we're going to talk about some dreams for your presence here at Transfiguration. Oh, okay. But for now, if you can lead us in a prayer sure absolutely in the name of the father and the son and the holy spirit amen amen heavenly father we thank you for your many blessings we thank you for the gift of our lives we thank you for our faith in jesus we thank you for his holy catholic church we ask that you would continue to bless and guide us as we strive to serve you in our our various vocations help us to work for your glory and the, the salvation of all and we ask this through christ our lord 
Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Stay tuned, everybody. Next week or at a future date, you're going to hear the rest of the story. And let me tell you, you're going to want to hear this. So, Father Lynch, great to be with you. My pleasure.